Um, so kind of when I'm playing a little bit with this, you know, expert beginner thing, I think because this is so new and it's, you know, just out of the reference for um, most even organic farming, even though it is a much a very much an organic process, um, we want to start with kind of, you know, trying to start with a beginner's mind. This is um, Suzuki Roshi in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. He says, if, you, if your mind is empty, it is always ready for anything. It is open to everything. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are few. And I find this about so many things that I've been doing. I've been working with this technology, I've seen so many models for five years, and I bet five of you at least in here might have really insightful, creative, innovative things to say about this that I never thought about. So please, as we go on um, and we share, and um, we have questions at the end, if you have anything or insights, please let me know. I am here to learn just as much as the next person, and Jason has taught me so much in our, um, in our great friendship. All right, so here's just kind of the content, so when you get this presentation, then you can kind of see what's going on. Um, so the first one. Uh, aqua's coming from aquaculture, as I spoke about. Uh, this is raising fish, right? Ponics coming from hydroponics, raising plants in a liquid solution. Okay, and there are several different definitions. I kind of like this last one, just because of the, the title of the book, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Aquaponic Garden. Please, come in, come in. Um, and uh, I, I like that a lot because I, I really feel like so many times I uh, approach these things, you know, I feel like I need the idiot's guide. Um, and it says, aquaponics is a gardening is gardening using a system in which the water from your fish tank irrigates your plants and then drains back into your fish tank. So this is a cycle, okay? We also call that fertigation. Fertigation. Anything else here? Go ahead. All right. Okay, so this has been going on for a very long time. Um, at least 3,000 years documented, maybe much longer than that. Okay? Um, to your left here, you have what look like normal rice paddies. Uh, this is in China, and what you're seeing is, is kind of stable water where they're growing fish inside the rice paddies and it's increasing their yield of the rice because the waste of the fish is breaking down and the plants take that up and use it for you know natural fertilizer so as an experiment some people who are growing rice anyway and we're growing some fish they just thought well this kind of looks like a pond right we'll just throw some fish in here and then it had we call a positive feedback right you where um, people were able to grow more rice and they were also getting fish, right? Okay? Here's other model here to the right is um, this is called the Aztec Chinampa. The Aztec uh, that was the Mesoamerican civilization before the Spanish got to um, Middle America, uh, what we call Central America. Um, and it was a alliance of three different city-states, one of them being the Mexica, the Mexica um, being what Mexico is named after. Um, and they basically, as you can see, they built canals of water and they had fish in there. And this water then kind of naturally seeped into uh, the plants roots, as you can see over there. So very much a stable kind of ponds next to what you're growing, right? Here they have trees and, you know, maize and other of these wonderful vegetables. Um, you know, and this was over 500 years ago, at least here in Central America, yes? Yeah, I remember studying this and the, the square footage is like very low and just, it will be like a family. Of, I don't know, like the square footage is something outrageous for remember. Mm -hmm. How much mm -hmm. do you get out of that? I guess in the climate or whatever. Right, yeah. right, right. For sure. So many. One of the things that excites us about aquaponics is that they're 
several things going on at the same time that are mutually beneficial. In permaculture, we call this stacking functions. Where in a small space, you don't just have corn, or you just don't have you know, soybeans, or whatever it would be, right? Lettuce or vegetables. That in a, in a same area, right, you might be able to feed you know, several families, which you might only be able to feed maybe one if you're only growing one thing or you know, growing one product. So really some diversity. Um, very interesting stuff. I'd just like to say, when I was in the Philippines in the rice paddies, I saw this happening, which was a real, which was extraordinary because I, I read about it first. Um, uh, Wade had introduced me to this, and then actually, it is actually still happening. And why not? I mean, you know, the stacking functions is exactly right. I mean, why not grow fish in the water that's irrigating your, um, irrigating your rice? You know, why just irrigate when you could fertigate? So. Right. Um, yeah, it's a second product and no extra uh, work involved, really, except tossing the fish in there. Right. And harvesting, which is my favorite. And harvest. Usually right. my favorite part of the process, whatever it be regarding food, you know. Um, so, as you can see, uh, really long, vibrant history, not very well documented. Um, but there is kind of reclaiming this, and uh, so we're, we're getting you know, more and more information, especially around archaeological digs. Yes, ma'am. Is that a year-round thing, or do they ever drain the fields? Um, depending on uh, where you're at, growing rice, China, Japan, um, sometimes they will flood the fields and then drain them. Okay. But within this system, um, it's year-round. Okay. And also the Chinapa is also a year-round system. As you had said harvesting, did you say harvesting the fish too? Yes. Just, okay. Yes. So I, you know, um, and that depends on uh, your scale, and you know when um, when they come to maturity, right? Okay. So now we've kind of went from a stagnant model, a pond model, to primarily um, a river model, which is like river as it runs. I don't know if you've ever been in any dry land, but then when you get close to the river, all of a sudden there's all this vegetation, right? That's, um, you know, uh, just pumping with its roots, just pumping out all this water from it. So, um, and um, if you come tomorrow, you will see this in the greenhouse. This is a very similar to what's in the greenhouse here at Trebekah. This is a shot from Growing Power, a nonprofit organization in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, it's doing great work. Um, pioneering work with aquaponics, uh, very insightful and um, incredible gentleman named Will Allen um, founded Growing Power. And we're going to see other models for this, and that's where this picture is from. So we went from kind of sta stagnant water and kind of the problems you might get with stagnant water to being able to pump it, and the pumping it can happen in different ways, um, mechanically, electrically. Uh, but we'll we'll get to that as we get to you know some other models. But we're just kind of we're shifting, and this is the one we're what we're building tomorrow. The aquaponics unit, we're going to be building a a river model. The water will be moving and fertilizing the plant and going fertilizing the plants, and then the water will going be, be going back into the fish tank. Okay. Can so I, can go I ahead. Say, um, yes. Well, this allows us to. Um, to take advantage of the process much more intensively. Because when you have moving water, uh, it's of course filtering through our media, and we'll get to how that happens here and, and beyond. But, um, but you can grow a lot more fish in the river model than the pond model. And um, yeah. yes, 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 no, great point. Yes, um, Don't the fish need sunlight, or in this model, it seems to be under cover there. Um, yes, and depending on where you're at, we'll see we actually have some open tanks, but it depends, you know, some, it depends on what fish are growing, um, you know, but. They, they really need next to no light. Uh, it helps if they can see each other, um, but, so if there's some pen, penetrating light where they don't run into each other, because fish rubbing up against one another can cause certain kind of diseases. Um, but really, they're used to operating in, in semi-dark or, or dark conditions. So um, there are some systems that we may or may not touch in the slides, I can't remember, but that basically are in the subfloor um, uh, under a grate or, um, you know, it helps to have exposure to, to water, but really very little light. 
is needed. And um, it also depends on how crowded they are, how much light they need. Because if they're really crowded, there needs to be a little more light. Um, and that's a, that's a challenge, because when it's crowded, it's more turbid. Um, al almost no light. So that, that's the system that gets the leak. That's the part of the system that gets practically done. Yeah. And remember, all this will be given, sent to you in email. Um, I feel like we're going too fast, and you know, if we are going really too fast, you're like, you lost me, raise your hand, and we'll, we'll slow it down, or any clar clarifications, please. Um, so this is kind of how it works. Okay? Starts off with the fish. The fish produce their waste, right? De and also food that you add also produces waste. Then the bacteria convert that waste, right? And we're going to talk about this very specifically, how this works. So the, the bacteria and also worms in these systems are kind of the energy that makes it happen. Um, they're doing all the hard work, okay? Then they make this waste into food for plants, and the plants take it up, they remove it from the water, so then clean water returns back to where the fish are, right? We all know how much, especially certain kinds of fish, really like clean water. Others like catfish, you know, they might they like the dark kind of murky stuff. Um, but they seem to like clean water too. So this is kind of the basic process. Um, and depending on the system, this happens a little differently. We're going to see somewhere plants are just submerged in water, and then the one that we're, bu we're building is has some type of medium like rock or. Uh, there's, and, and we'll get to that, but um, what that allows for is for the bacteria to grow on the rock. Um, to grow on, we have some uh, some kiln fired slate. Kiln fired slate, and so basically cooked earth. And um, what? But it's got a lot of surface area, so the bacteria can grow on there. And the more bacteria, you ha healthy bacteria you have, it helps convert this waste. And it just makes the system work better. Right? Okay. So this is a little more details. I'm going to go through this kind of quick because we'll, we'll go on to some other things. But basically, you have a toxic form of nitrogen, okay? And in the form of um, you know excreting the fish excrete ammonia, and also the deco decomposing food and, and waste produce ammonia, okay? And that ammonia is converted by a certain type of bacteria into nitrites, and then is eventually converted into nitrates, and that's what the plants like. Okay? This is the same thing that's happening within, you could say, like a compost pile, where you might have um, a toxic form of nitrogen in the form of ammonia, and then it is converted, it decomposes, and is processed by this bacteria and then is now made available into a form of nitrogen that the plants really like. Okay. It's such a great slide. I need to print this one out and like put it on the system because it just captures exactly what's happening. Yes, um, but go ahead. And I'd just like to mention, um, once, and we may get to this, but once, once it gets to the nitrite level, um, once the fish get sort of nitrite poisoning, um, it takes a couple weeks for them to recover, even if you get the system back in balance. Um, and are, are we gonna cover what happens at that point to the fish or symptoms? Uh, go ahead. I may as well go ahead and say it. Um, if your fish have nitrite poisoning, it, it basically, I'm not a fish scientist, but it basically um, prevents them from absorbing oxygen. So the nitrites bind with their hemoglobin so they can't get oxygen, even though it's in the water. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll start piping, which they, they'll put their mouths up at the top, and it looks like they're gasping for air. Uh, if that's happening, you have either, you either don't have enough air in there, in the systems, in which case you need to add air stones or something, or you need to test, and you should do this every week, uh, I don't do it always every week, um, but for nitrites, uh, there's a little easy test you can use. Uh, it's really dangerous for the fish, and at that point, what you wanna do uh, there is a, a non-toxic um, um, additive that you can put in the water, uh, and you can do that, but the, the, simp the simplest, the quickest thing to do is to change the water. Simply 
take out 20% of the water every day, pour it on your plants, they'll grow like crazy, pour it on your worm pile, they'll grow like crazy, and then add fresh water, preferably water that, is, that has been um, off-gassed, um, the chlorine, after a few days, um, which it'll do. So um, that's an ex a really important uh, part of the process, and it's constantly changing because as they grow, they'll be grow, they'll be excreting more waste, and um, your biological filter is growing with their growth. So the more of these uh, these beneficial bacteria that are fed, if they're happy, they'll they'll multiply. So that, so um, the goal is to keep that. On, at a balance, right? But you'll get out of balance invariably, and, and you just have to watch um, for signs that the fish are suffering. If they're not eating their food like they should, that's, a, a, that's you should watch never, like, you can do an automatic feeder and it's helpful, but first thing in the morning, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to throw food on the water and, and watch how they behave. If they're not eating vigorously, there's something wrong, and you should probably go ahead and test. And, and the best way to know how, if they're off their feet is just of observation, watching them every day, and you'll know, just like, you know when your children are sick because they're not behaving like they usually do, it's, you gotta, the, you gotta watch them every day to know what normal is so you can understand what abnormal is. And so throw them that feed, if they're not feeding right, there's something wrong with them. Or, um, and so overfeeding is a very common problem with, nit with nitrites. If you throw food to them and it just rots in the water or falls to the bottom, uh, that is where you're going to get uh, water quality problems, and and the and the and the, uh, the biological filter won't be able to metabolize that. You know, sometimes it's down in the bottom of the system. So it's important to be able to match the feed with their needs and not overfeed them, because you get water quality problems. If you underfeed them, um, you get uneven growth. So a lot of the fastest, stronger fish get bigger and the little fish miss out, and that gap between the different fish grows. That's not, that, that can be helped, but, um, you know, so, um, and I know I'm wandering through this, but this also is connected to how, are we gonna get to how, how, we, how we know how much to feed them? Okay, so, so we'll, we'll get to that, but, um, but that's, that's kind of a string of things that you have to keep in mind. So this is an incredibly important thing to keep close. Charlie? Where does algae come into play in this water quality and so, balance? Yes, uh, algae um, comes when you have um, too much toxins, basically, and it's too much nitrogen, and mostly in the form of ammonia in the water. And in China, which we're gonna get to this slide, in China, they actually, took away all this huge algae growth, or algae bloom, what they call it, um, by starting aquaponics. Because then the plants filtered out all the nitrogen, and the water cleared up again. So um, what uh, Jason did a great job is, uh, of describing is, is that the plants here are just as important as the fish, because they are keeping the water clean uh, for the fish. Um, and so we call this a symbiotic relationship between the two. They both kind of dance together. And if the dance is good, there is incredible abundance that comes from it. Um, and you'll see some of that. And just one last, one last thing about that. Um, you have to match your media to the number of fish and the size of fish. So if you don't have enough rocks in your system, just, I'll just call them rocks, whatever your media is, um, your fish will grow past a certain point and there's not enough surface area for enough bacteria to grow. Does that make sense? So if you don't have enough media, uh, there's just simply not space for the beneficial bacteria to grow and you'll reach a, a cap. So you, you have, there is a uh, cubic feet of media to fish ratio that you have to keep in mind. And, and you don't have, it helps to know it, and, and there's a book uh, that we'll share with you that, that has a good references for this, uh, Aquaponic Gardening, that's right. Um, uh, that'll help you understand that, and just seeing a system will help you kind of visualize it, but it is a reality that you could, you could reach a point when you simply can't grow more bacteria on the, the existing media, and at that point you're stuck. You either got to fill up more media, or harvest some fish, or, or put them, 
put more fish in a different tank or something. So, uh, was it Braxton? Did you have a question? Yeah, well, if, if you're getting, if the fish are suffering, there's more of that nitrite stuff, and it's hitting your plants, do your plants get over fertilized and kind of get screwy, or what? Is, it, is there some sort of relation there? The, the problem with excess nitrogen is it attracts aphids and uh, any lush growth. This is true in the garden as well. So you, you might get pest problems. Uh, but let me say about this system, it's an exuberantly fertile system. And so you always have more fertility than you need in the system. So you can export it to your plants. You know, you're not, the, 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 um, the, the limiting factor is not fertility. It's getting that night. It's for the fish getting that night. Those nitrates breaking down, that ammonia breaking down. So, yes, there's there's plenty of fertility. There's more than you need. Sometimes that can attract pet, cause the plants to attract pests. But they'll just grow. They'll basically get more lush and grow faster. They those nitrates don't hurt the plants. They just not. But but without enough bacteria, there that those um, it's not being broken down to the form they can use. So it's the phase between the nitrate. And Nitrate is where right. the issue occurs. The plants will be yeah. fine, but the fish will suffer. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quick because um, there's a lot here. But um, some strengths of aquaponics. So why why do this at all? Um, why you know spend time thinking about these things and coming to a lecture about them or uh, why? What's the benefits? Um, well, for one, you have extreme water conservation. This is being, this is, aquaponics is huge in Australia um, where, you know, there's a lot of drought conditions. Um, it's being tried in several different places where there's not as much water. When you take water and you put it on the land, just, you know, filters in, who knows if it's getting to your plants in a lot of places. But here, you know where the water's at and it's, con you use the same water to continually water your plants. So it's a very efficient system in that way. Um, I say it's like, it's, it's, you can grow, it's, it uses a tenth of the water of field culture. It's that conservative. Yeah, one tenth. It's pretty incredible. Um, planting and harvesting at a convenient height. You're going to see, because you can build these systems however you like to, as far as mod if you're modifying, or when you if you you know buy a commercially built system, you can put where they're at, so you don't have to you know bend over. Um, and it, which is, this is great for you know several populations that. Maybe you know, um, like physically handicapped, or that they can they can reach it, um, and it's easy for them. Um, also, you're growing, as we talked about, growing protein, the fish, and the vegetables together in a compact space, as we were alluding to earlier. Um, no dependence on commercial fishing, and it's an extensive environmental damage, um, and we can talk about that all day. So I'll move on. Uh, possibility to repurpose materials instead of sending them to landfill. So we're taking, we're recycling a 275 gallon, um, what they call IBC tote. IBC tote. And um, we're turning into something that's, you know, being beneficial for humans. So um, uh, it avoids the mercury and other toxins typically in wild fish, as well as um, once the system is built, very little maintenance is required except for Harvesting and planting, checking and feeding the fish every day, touch, you know, testing the water, and making sure that your pump is working, whatever pump system that you have. Um, when I was interning with Dr. Paul Range, he said five minutes a day. Just go out, spend five minutes, and that's all you have to do. And it will produce incredibly for you. Um, and he was right. He didn't spend too much time on it, and his systems were uh, wonderful. Um, also, as Jason just highlighted, you export fertility, uh, but the problem is the solution here. Water change, you take that fertility right, as Jason was just saying. Put that water on your other plants. Put that water on your, you know, your worms or your fruit trees or whatever it is. Um, and we have some limitations uh, as well. We want to, you know, try to be honest here with the systems. Uh, they require some investment of materials, maintenance, and, and money, capital. Um, and depending on what scale you're doing and how much you're repurposing materials, getting used materials, or you're buying new can really change between, you know, the system that we're building at a high, 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 um, you know, way overestimating the cost of repurposing will be under $400. But you can buy a commercial system for about the same size for several thousand. 
Um, number two, it's dependent on an energy source to pump water and materials for repair. One of the things about, um, I won't go on the next thing, um, this is just some, some other things that are important to um, check out as far as permaculture, permaculture goes, but what, um, what Dr. Paul Range found when he went to Haiti to build these systems after um, you know the natural disaster that happened there very recently, he found out there wasn't a hardware store. So when something fit, you know, broke, he wasn't able to go just get the part really easily. So it is kind of dependent on what's around you and the technology that you, you bring. You know, if he would have went there and built from the materials they had instead of bringing stuff, you know, his materials there, then he would have been, you know, had the re maybe replacement parts or whatever it is. Can I say that? Yes. About that. Um, I, I'm just taking a small rabbit trail to talk about international uh, development. This is exciting for me to think about how this can be good news to the majority world. And um, when we were in Africa this spring talking to farmers about how they could use this, they grow a lot of, there's a lot of aquaculture there. And um, they're, but they're not using the fertility. They're basically, there's a system which uh, captures a stream, uh, diverts it into a farm, grows fish in a pond, and there's a grate to keep the fish from leaving, and then it just goes right back into the stream. And, but that's a, um, that's a pollution problem. And so we were talking about ways that they could divert that water um, through their gardens. And um, the more edge they could give it, uh, and I think that is a, the use of edge on there, I'm not sure. Yes, that's um, number 11. Uh, the, the more edge they give it, the more opportunities for that fertility to be metabolized by their plants. So instead of it becoming a pollution problem, I encourage them to think of it as an asset that they were flushing down the river. Like capture that, uh, and that's another one. Capture, capturing the uh, capturing the energy and the um, the fertility that's just getting lost from the farm. So there's a way of even creating very simple circuitous routes of this. Um, of this fertility stream that's often in um, majority world system just going away and becoming a pollution problem. Um, potentially even uh, one thing they do is they, um, they create nets on the edge of a lake and they just grow a lot of fish there and that just seeps pollution into the hole and, and sometimes deadens the lake. I saw this in the Philippines quite a bit. Uh, it happens in Africa. It happens especially uh, all over Asia. But that water could potentially be, if, it, uh, if it's not saltwater fish, if, if we're talking about a freshwater uh, body of water, it could be potentially just pumped up the hill and wind its way down through gardens and, and fertilize and, and be cleaned as it goes, right? And then return to, so it, it could become, you, you can, if you got a way to get the water, push the water around, you know, there's always a way of capturing that, that part. And so I think it, it has, uh, it doesn't have to be as complex as some of the systems, even though they're fairly simple. Um, it, it, we, we can use nature to, to make them uh, a, a very applicable system in places like Haiti. And I'm very, I'm very excited about that. Um, was it, there a question back here? Sam? Yeah, um, maybe I'll ask you something a little too specific, but the change that you notice in the facility of your plants if you redirect take the fish water into them, is that something that's just kind of, is it noticeable or is it just sort of a in essence sort of difference or could you actually see an increased yield in your plants? Would it be like equivalent to fertilizing them with, um, you know, commercial fertilizers? Could it, could it be a substitute for something like that? The growth is dramatic. It's very noticeable. Uh, in this system, for instance, plants can grow up to four times as fast. Uh, you can get lettuce in 29 days in some of these systems. That's fast. Um, full heads of lettuce. Things grow noticeably quicker in this system because you have fertility flowing through their roots actively. I've yes, ma'am? Does that um, generate too much uh, leafy growth, vegetative growth? Have you ever had a, something you're you know, trying to get blooms on? And, and it produced too much vegetative growth? Usually what we're growing here is leafy growth. Okay. So we, ex we encourage excessive leafy growth. Okay. We just harvest yeah, excessively. You don't normally grow anything, 
Good question. We do grow some fruiting plants. We grow uh, tomatoes, okay. and they do tend to be leafier okay. because when you when you excess fertilize uh, tomatoes with nitrogen, right. uh, you get a lot of foliage and not a lot of fruits. Um, th that's typical, but we get a lot of tomatoes off of our okay. system. Um, maybe it's just a bat the, the, that there's so much other stuff as well. Um, so yeah, maybe they are leafier than others, but we still get plenty of tomatoes. And I've seen systems where, you know, it's important that they get a lot of light so that they're at the top of the system. But tomatoes tend to love this system. Yeah, we're going through the tobacco effect. Um, so um, these are just some principles to kind of think about when you're designing uh, David Holmgren's 12 permaculture principles. Um, as I already mentioned them to be in the sake of respect of time, I think we're going to keep moving on um, and just talk a little bit about design questions um, that incorporate a lot of these principles. Um, so is this technology appropriate for the specific ecosystem? You know, um, and whatever technology it is or, you know, doing organic gardening outside, it's always kind of important to, you know, look out where you're at. How, how does it change? Um, are you in the urban environment? Are you in a desert? Are, and then the next one, how does the ecosystem influence the design? Is it outside or, you know, or inside a greenhouse? You know, here at the urban farm, it's inside a greenhouse, so the temperature is much easier to um, kind of control. Um, and also scale, which we're about to show you several different types of scale. It's always saying how small, I think uh, really, you know, what, some good wisdom is start small, have success, and then grow from there. Um, so that's what I found. Um, also, goals for food production and the resources required to get that production. Time and labor, you know. Do you want to check on this for five minutes every day and just get whatever you do out of it? Or are you going to be doing it as a part of your living? Are you looking to feed your family with it? Um, or at least a substantial amount of the food that your family eats. You know, these are design questions. Also about recycled materials or new materials. Um, continuous flow. So is it going to be like a continuous river? Or are you going to maybe only pump the water a couple times an hour, which that means you can grow a plant that likes its roots to be a little drier. Um, and um, I think we'll address your question when it get, gets more about how we integrate like certain types of plants versus certain types of fish regarding, um, you know, for what like tomatoes or other things that are producing fruit, what kind of flow and what kind of nutrients should they be getting um, from the water. Also, does this design have redundancy? The, the one kind of um, you know, catch-22 of the aquaponic system is if you're moving water, you need something to move it. Um, and if that's no longer moving it, then you get into the stagnant water um, scenario, and there might not be enough oxygen coming in, and then you, your fish might be getting, you know, nitrite um, poisoning, as, as Jason was describing earlier. So these are kind of things to keep in mind. Okay, so here we go. System scales, everything from apartment and window size. I mean, we're talking real small. You can do, you can do this in an old yoga, yogurt container, you know, with like one fish and like a plant on top. I mean, you can make it small. I've seen it super small. I mean, just like small used bottles uh, hanging in people's windows. And then you do small, mid-scale. That's what I would say is here. This is more like feeding several families. And then full commercial, obviously, um, feeding many. Uh, selling a lot of your excess produce. So here we go, apartment size model. You're growing, it looks like basil, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then, and not even an edible fish, right? He's got a goldfish down there. And they're circulating the water in this little pump, right? You see it's, um, you know, plugged in here. So they have got a regular fish tank, and they're like, you know, they would like some fish, but they don't want to have to clean their water all the time. If you ever had a fish tank, you know you got to change out the water. So if you don't want to do that, you can just have the plants, like a wetland, clean that water for you. And this can even be just purely aesthetic, right? It doesn't even have to be food production. You can just have some beautiful goldfish or koi and, you know, maybe some wonderful flowers. Um, even though I'm very interested in the food production myself, 
uh, for several reasons. You know, it, it could just be beautiful. Um, here's one of those low-tech solutions I was telling you about. Um, fish tank, right? They just take the water and they're just circulating it through some, it looks like some pebble gravel. They've got some trees on there. Um, and, you know, they're just pumping it. Who knows how much they're pumping it? But um, looks like the plants are pretty healthy, right? Look like it's pretty successful in that sense. Um, this comes out of uh, two major thinkers and movers in the aquaponic, uh, aquaponic movement. One of them is the Dr. Uh, Paul Range I was telling you about that I interned with, um, and then also a gentleman named Travis Huey, and we have his resources in the, on the last slide that you'll, that you'll have. Um, but it's called barrel ponics. Obviously so, right? Taking a couple barrels, slice them in half, put some gravel in there, put some plants in it, create a fish tank, and then just circulate the water. Up here at the top, as you can see on the right screen, that's called a dump tank, which you're basically just pressurizing the water, just like a waterfall. You put your water up at the top, and then it comes back down and goes back in your fish tank. Um, so a lot of people are using all kinds of different materials. It's just really exciting how innovative you can get. You can just take something that's, because you basically have two containers. One container's holding your fish, and one container's holding your plants. And then you're just moving water between those. And that could be a, as elaborate or as simple as we saw in that apartment size one, the really small one. Here is one of the 275 gallon IBC totes. We're building it a little bit differently, but I put this on here because this is almost very identical to what we're building tomorrow. Uh, so I encourage you to please come to that. We're gonna be doing it together um, at, a, at a slow pace, and we're gonna be, we're gonna be cutting it and doing all the, the steps. So you'll be able to see it start to finish tomorrow from, from 9 to 3. Um, and keep in mind, we'll, we'll talk about this, but whatever materials you use in the system, from the container to the media to any glues you might consider using or anything, uh, you have to ask the question, will the fish want to live with it and will I want to eat it? It will be in your body at some point. Um, this is a international beverage container, I think is IBC. I, yeah. I, I made that, if, it's, if that's not it, then let's just pretend it is. Um, <laughs> um, so it, it's something that was used for food production. Some of these aren't. Whenever you get your barrels, your IBC totes, or anything else, ask the question, what was in it? And make sure you get the right answer. Uh, if it was diesel fuel or uh, your glue, don't use that container. It might be free, but you don't want to eat that. Your fish won't like to live in it. So food grade, that's what you want. You want something that's been uh, a food grade container, and you want a media that uh, is clean and pH neutral. Uh, you don't want something that's gonna uh, throw the balance of your fish off uh, or, or pollute them, you know. Everything should be really clean and, and ready to eat off of, because you are gonna eat off of it. Is yeah. limestone a good, uh, a good medium? I would guess not because it's lime, which would bring down the pH. Yeah, it's basic. Um, so you want something that's pH neutral. Um, you know, river rock will work if you want to go collect river rock out of a, the right kind of river. Um, but think about surface area too. You've got a bunch of big stones, you're not getting much. You want tiny, you know, a lot of surface area. Yes. Something that's clean. Yeah. Could you just give a couple of examples of of oh, the media? Yeah, um, there, we have in there the hydroton, which is the um, kiln fired shale. What? Go ahead. That's clay. Clay. The hydroton. Right. It's clay, okay, yeah. Um, it's very small balls um, that have been, you know, in the cooking process in the kiln to a very high temperature. They've been broken open, so they have really, really, really high surface area. So that bacteria can get in there and grow and flourish and then make this, uh, you know, uh, conversion from a toxic form of nitrogen to a, a available form of nitrogen that the plants can then take up and remove those toxins from the water. Um, here, go, go ahead. Think about like a coral reef, um, all the little nooks and crannies that things live on. Uh, each one of those pieces is like, you know, meters or kilometers of, of, of actual surface area. 
Um, and so as opposed to a marble that has a very limited surface area, Hyderton or something else with, with a lot of crevices uh, will have you know, many, many times the amount of surface area for bacteria to grow. So you want a lot of surface area. So the smaller the better, and if you actually get the kind of materials we have, um, then there's some other factors. Like Hyderton floats, so it'll actually float down your system if you don't, and, and end up uh, kind of clogging things up if, if you're not careful. Um, the, the slate, the kiln-fired slate that we use now, doesn't go anywhere, it just sits there, but there's still a lot of surface area. Uh, we wash our rocks carefully before we put them in, and uh, yeah, and you don't have to buy it, but we have because it's much more efficient at converting nitrogen. It's kind of one of the expensive parts of the system, though. Um, here's a 275-gallon um, tote, uh, very similar to what we're going to be uh, building. Though the one we just built, this is the second one that we're building here. We've already built one, and it's up and running, so you'll be able to see it. It doesn't have the abundance that you see here yet, but because there's, as Jason was speaking about earlier, there's a lot of fertility in the system. So different than what you could say in a small scale gardening, where you have to give plants space um, for roots and other things, which you do have to give space here, but you might have to give them space just for the sheer amount that there's enough nutrients in the soil for them. Here, there's excess fertility, so you can kind of stack them together. As you can see in this system, they're growing, they're just growing everything they can fit in there. Um, the plants seem super happy. All kinds of chard, and you can see chives over there. All right, so another kind of mid-size. Here's another one, of a uh, picture of that. They've linked several of these totes together. This is the grow bed here at the top. And then at the bottom, you can see over there, that's where the fish tanks are. And then they're, you know, recirculating the water, taking the water from the fish tank up into the grow beds, watering the vegetables, and then the water goes back in the fish tank. So we call it closed looped system, right? It's making a circle. Here's a beginning one where they're doing a whole greenhouse of just these totes. You know, if you can recycle, this can be, uh, you could be doing the same size system as if you're looking to get bigger. Another great um, asset of this is that you have redundancy. With a very large system, if your pump fails or something goes wrong, you have a very large problem. Here, if you have separate fish tanks, one, if one is having a problem, you're not losing all of your production or whatever you're growing at the time, and you not, might not be endangering all the fish that you have. So it's good to think about scale and also uh, redundancy to be able to kind of make the system resi resilient. That's what we're looking for, resiliency. The, the redundancy is also helpful in whatever systems are keeping your fish alive. Um, so we have, we often have uh, water air stones going. I think I don't have them going at the moment. My fish are so tiny they don't need it. Um, but that's a, they don't really need that because there's so much air getting trapped in the water as it falls through the system that you saw. But if the pump breaks, then they're just sitting there with no air. So there's a redundancy, that is there's a backup that there's an air bubbler infusing oxygen in there. There's uh, Many systems will have backup pumps. When water flow ceases to move through a, through a pipe, there's a trigger that starts a battery or, or gas-generated uh, pump, like say the electricity goes off. This has happened in my building. They decided to replace some breaker in uh, the Great House Science Building. I'll just flip the electricity off. What could go wrong, right? Well, I've, I'm all of a sudden, uh, my, my fish are, don't have air, right? And so um, redundancy backs up all those things because especially when you, as your fish get larger, things can go sideways very quickly. Uh, they can't last a few hours without water, you know? So um, you have building in redundancy is helpful like that. Mm -hmm. um, here's a larger scale system. We're now we're getting closer to more than commercial. Um, as you can see, it's at a convenient height. So you can just go, stand normally, and harvest, right? Um, we may yeah. also say having multiple systems of, what do we say? Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, will allow you to have separate harvests. So you're not harvesting once a year. We, tomorrow we'll make our third system. That means we could pretty much have fish about continuously. Because you, if you do it perfectly, they'll all be ready at once. 
But as it usually happens, you've got some larger and some smaller fish. So if you've got three or four systems, you can always be pulling the largest guy out for dinner and have a continual harvest, right? Uh, so that's another thing that multiple systems allow you, not only redundancy, but also staggering that's harvest. Yeah, staggering, so, you know, creating, um, and uh, one great thing about that is, is as you take out plants for harvest, if you're changing different plants, this is your biofilter, right? This is your biological filter. Your plants are taking out these nutrients, so you got to put plants back in. And, de and depending on your system, if you kind of got that balance, even with your plants harvested, then you can kind of still have this continuous filtration, like you would have wet. Okay. Moving on. Here's a larger uh, barrel system. You can see uh, their fish tanks down here, and they're kind of doing that. Though they are recirculating the water, this one over here to the right. You can see there are fish in that one. They just have some plants floating in there. Like just like a shallow water, um, you know, any type of water system that you would see. So very, very similar. Um, these systems in their best are trying to mimic uh, patterns in nature that are working wonderfully. Um, and so that's kind of what we're looking for as far as the design. But you can see, you can build them almost out of hardly anything as long as it's food grade and safe. And it holds the weight. That's the other thing. Water, you know, gravel, whatever it is, it's got to be able to hold the weight. Um, this is where good engineering comes in. We just make each one of those shelves in the river system that Wade that, that showed us, which you'll see tomorrow. Um, they weigh uh, one to two thousand pounds. You know, so there's a lot of weight when you're talking about gallons of water and rock and plant material sitting on there, it's more than you would guess. So make sure you've got, you know, you've got a real sturdy structure because once that fills up with water, it can come crashing down if you don't have something heavy, something sturdy underneath it. Right, right. And, and these systems, the closer to Mother Earth, almost the better. Because uh, the higher you get up, the, the gravity. Uh, like oh, yeah. building one of these large systems on top of a roof, the architects that built that roof, you know, we're probably planning for this. Um, you know, an extra maybe ten to 15,000 pounds, depending on what it is. Yes, ma'am? Um, I talked to somebody who had installed them in the ground. Yes, yes, and What's we're going to get... opinion on that? Um, well, it can be really wonderful for a couple of reasons. Um, and we'll get to that when we get to growing power, which will okay. be coming up pretty quick, because they have installed, just like the river system that's outside there, with the several tiers, they have their fish tanks in the ground, and it's got several benefits. Um, here's another small commercial um, unit. Really easy to see. You got lettuce, rainbow chart up there, and the fish below. Um, here we go. Growing power. Let's answer this question. A lot of these tanks are buried in the ground. The first um, in the Good Food Revolution that Will Allen wrote, very recent book that came out. Um, it's kind of an autobiography. Uh, and a, um, a great uh, work about kind of this, what they're doing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, they, he talks about just digging a very long, um, you know, ditch in the middle of his greenhouse. Uh, Jason can't do this out there because he's on the top of a concrete pad. But so that when, once you get below a certain, depending on where you're at, li where you're living, the ecosystem, um, and, you know, I say this because, you know, there's geothermal heat and stuff like this, but normally so, once you get down several feet, the ground's staying like 55 degrees. So you only have to heat or cool your fish tank water from 55 degrees. So um, there's a lot of greenhouse innovations that are looking at kind of earth shelters or berms around them or, or any type of kind of earthen structure to help regulate the temperature um, of the water or the air or anything like this. So, yes, um, the, very effective to putting your fish tank in the ground, usually. Can you, I'm just interested in uh, bringing you into this, can you think of any advantages or disadvantages to having it in the ground? You guys want to put you in? Yeah. Paul? Space. Space. Right. What do you do with underground space in your greenhouse? Nothing. Right? Subfloor. It's what you stand on. You could put a grate over that and walk on it, like I mentioned earlier. Um, it could be in the so it could be in the paths if you wanted, and then you could pick the grate up to 
work the fish harvest or whatever. Any other advantages or disadvantages you can think of? Possibly the water will go down the, the earth. Yeah, uh, yeah. What if you get a leak? Yeah, right. 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 So they, they actually have installed a sump pump below the bottom of their systems in case it starts leaking. It will pump it back out and back into the system. So they've got a bucket just slightly below. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Would that Any matter, others? Could you use something else other than an IBC container in that instance? In that instance, you would. You what would. you would use is pond liner. Uh, let me just describe briefly how they do it. They dig the, they dig the ditch. They, um, they put um, plywood on the wall. Um, then they put, um, they, then they put um, uh, sorry, insulation, heavy grade insulation that can withstand the push of the water, right? And then on the insulation, they put pipes Rate, uh, these are called PEX pipes. It's it's like it's flexible. They run a they run these little flexible pipes all around it like a radiator sur surrounding the tank. Um, and then they put I'll tell you what that's for in a moment. Um, then they put a uh, pond liner all around it um, and, and secure that and, and, and like bring it up over the top the edge and then secure it to the sides um, of the t of the of the wood frame. So um, then you just got a big pond thing. Um, and and, and the, what the pipe is for is they run the pipe through their compost piles. Their hot compost pile. Their hot compost pile will get 160 degrees when it's good, and theirs are good. They use spent uh, brewery mash, of which they get tens of thousands of pounds a week. Um, they mix it with wood chips, which they also get for free. And they run this pipe through that, and you have hot water coming back into the system, and so that's how it's regulated. Isn't that amazing? That it's an incredible use of biological heat. And that's your biggest cost, especially if you're, near, you're in Milwaukee, is hot is heating the water all winter. Here's the thing, um, stacking functions. You've got to heat a greenhouse through the winter anyway. You may as well heat the water. If you're gonna heat the air, the air just goes up, right? And right out of the greenhouse. It's, it's a terrible use of energy. But if you heat water, it creates a thermal battery and it very slowly releases that to the, through the day. If you get a sunny day in the winter, it'll be plenty warm inside the greenhouse. The water will absorb that and will, will be a heat battery that, that just radiates gently through the night rather than just blows up through the cracks of your greenhouse. So the, even if you didn't have fish, you, you'd sooner want to heat a barrel of water than heat the air to warm it. This is stacking those functions. You're heating water at the very lowest point of the greenhouse. So I, you'll see tomorrow, I've got a greenhouse heater that's at the top of my greenhouse. Really super poor design, right? Yeah. It goes right straight up. This is at the yeah. bottom of my greenhouse. It's even in the floor here. So at the, everything above it, which is everything, uh, gets the benefit of that rising heat. So it's a super smart way of doing things. Here's the disadvantage. You've got to get down in that and clean it out every time you need to work it. It's hard to reach. If you need to if you drop your false teeth in there, if you if you if you lose something, whatever you need to do down in the bottom of that, you gotta go swimming, spelunking in this. It's a it's a deep. It's a these are ten, these are hundred thousand fish tanks that you saw running through there. So they're they're a significant amount of water. Were you um, aiming your comment about false teeth and things? I was not. I was not aware you had false teeth. Um, sorry, I don't know that you do. Um, my grandmother does. Yes, uh, Sam. Um, yeah, would you need to uh, heat the air in addition to the water if, if you let the plants at the top? So if the hot water was going to the fish first and then it cycles back down through the plants, would that have the, the excess function of just doing the plants as well? My goal is only to heat the water. Right. I've gone whole winters with only doing that. Last winter I was unable to do it. My, my heater was disconnected for two years. We grew plants in that greenhouse all through the winter. It was chilly but tolerable um, so last last was a pretty severe winter we got a little below zero uh, or just above the zero last and it stayed quite cold it couldn't keep up with it and so I was forced to hook it back up uh, somewhat belatedly and, um, and and had to use that terrible air heater some but this can handle I mean 
yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, thermodynamics. Uh, you got, you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. In our climate, now, mind you, they're doing this in Milwaukee, zone what three maybe. Um, yeah. So this is cold up there. We we have a greater advantage than they do. Uh, in that and this is a this is a great design question. Where are you at? You know, how how is temperature regulated? Do you have extreme highs, extreme lows? And if you're growing even plants, right? Plants don't really like that. You know, it can wilt depending on what you're growing. If it's lettuce, or you know, it can die off if it's too if it's too cold. So, um, but. When you have a system with fish, then it becomes kind of, you know, depending on how the, you know, the fish, um, what temperatures they like, then it becomes a little more uh, tedious and at least detail oriented. And we'll talk about that when we get we get to that. Here's a great picture of Will Allen. This is the uh, large gentleman to the right who's holding the, the fish up. Um, used to be a pro basketball player. Um, grew up farming and bought. A, uh, what's now growing power, this massive urban farm that you know is built with their organization. He, he built it to sell vegetables and excess produce. I mean, it's grown in something wonderful. Uh, here's another photo. So here's at level, right? I mean, he's probably got to bend down because he's just so tall. But um, you can see below to the right, that underneath that PVC pipe running, that is the, the fish tank. And then above that, you have greens, very easy to harvest as far as height. And, and you know, these have been designed so there's enough space where you can get into the fish tank, but as well as, you know, it's convenient. You can harvest, you know, you, know, you can keep your back straight and your spine straight, so you don't um, have any problems with that. So that's growing power. Uh, here's another model, but I really like the photo because it kind of captures both. Small space, growing fish, and lettuce right above it. Um, and they're, they're growing together. Here's a very large uh, commercial system. Now we're moving into the larger commercial systems. Um, here is uh, all kinds of different types of lettuce. These are on floating barges. As you can see in the back, there are tanks. That's where the fish are. And they're pumping the water through these areas. It takes a pretty large amount of energy uh, to make this transfer. But you're also getting a very large amount of produce, as you can see, right? This is a massive greenhouse. Let's see if I got another one of it. Yeah, here's a better shot. Um, so, you know, this is a small farm. Um, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. All right, let's move on. Yes? More previously. Yeah. You said so this is a commercial farm. Yes. And is, this, is that really it? Um, there are other facilities as well, but this is just one section of their aquaponics. So what, what would be like the game, profit game? Um, they're, you know, the fish and also whatever produce they're, um, and depending on, you know, you could be selling specialty um, greens, uh, my, uh, growing power, they're selling, you know, microgreens, all, all of these really kind of specialty things that re a lot of, um, you know, say more fine dining restaurants are looking for it, or pay or you know they will pay a lot of money for it uh, like here if you have horseradish fresh local organic horseradish um, is really profitable because uh, hardly anybody can get it in the city of Nashville or in the surrounding area so they, these are kind of depending on I don't know what they'd be selling but the profits could be pretty large depending on who they're selling to is it wholesale or not are they selling directly to their customer um, but then also, you know, as far as fish goes, um, for sushi places, if you're buying, you can, you know, coordinating with a local restaurant, you know, they want you to grow certain types of food for their uh, dinner menu, and you can grow it for, for them, and then you can deliver it live right there the same day within a few miles. You know, this is much, you know, this is much, much fresher than they could get any, any place else. <coughs> and there's not kind of these risk factors um, more transparency, right? They could come by and see it. Um, check out what you're doing, as well as there's not kind of these harmful um, risks that are possible with wild fish, like Jason was talking about, uh, plastics and mercury um, within the wild fish. And, so, um, you know, the average American eats 55 heads of lettuce a year. It's a lot of lettuce. Um, a lot of these systems will grow just straight up lettuce. 
And the way this raft system works is that you know you put them in as babies and they flow down. You'll take the last one out, harvest it, and then all the other rafts push down. In the raft system, uh, the roots are literally just floating below uh, the raft that's floating on the water. And, and so they're just directly in the water flowing through them. Do we have a picture? Yeah, I think we have that. Yep. Yeah, there we go. There's a good one. See that? So no medium, no medium at all. They're just soaking up those nutrients. And so it just flows through the system. You know, you put a new one in, you take, you take an old one out, a uh, finished one out. Um, Nelson and Payne will harvest 30 heads every day. They'll sell them for 275 each, you know. So you actually get um, a lot more money from the vegetables than the fish. So average, uh, I can't remember what the percentage is, but it's, it's something like fourfold. Um, you, so you, you produce a lot more vegetation than you do fish. Uh, both, both in terms of weight of vegetables and dollars, if you're the commercial. This is the Nelson and Pate, right? Where this is what Jason was talking about. We have floating rafts um, coming down, and the fish are underneath there, um, and they're circulating the water. Um, let's go the one back before that. Here's one outside. Here another floating. I mean, this is outdoors, right? It's a seasonal system. Um, yes. How does something like this do without media? Um, so there are a lot of other ways to get beneficial bacteria. Um, and when its systems are compartmentalized by this, they might have other filters with a lot of, you know, depending on medium or whatever it is, filtering these things out and growing and putting a lot of this beneficial bacteria actually in the water. So that's kind of how they make it happen. Um, but that depending on what the commercial system is, they might also just be monitoring it very, very, very close. There's a, it gets, it gets a little complicated how they do it, but uh, there's a certain, um, there's a certain arc at which water can flow that the solids will just peel off very quickly, and so they, 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 they have this kind of arc filter that takes all the solids down. They take those solids out and put it on uh, a bed of, you know, a different bed of food and grow like crazy. Uh, then they actually jet the water through this, um, it looks like a popcorn popper of, um, of media where it's just, just very turbulent rushing around in, in another whole tank. And then after it's done going through there, then they, then they, put, then they flow it through these, these wraps. Um, it's pretty complex, um, but Nelson and Pate has kind of mastered it. They're up in uh, Milwaukee as well. And uh, Brian Wong, who works with us here on the, the urban farm, he, he's gone and visited and kind of learned their system. We're, we're attempting to raise the money to build one here, a very large um, third of an acre greenhouse where we're doing this commercially. And if we do, we'll do it that way. Yeah. Maybe angel investors that want to drop a half a million dollars on this just uh -huh. see me afterward. <laughs> to talk with you. Um, so it's got some pain. Um, <clears throat> see that here is uh, one in Japan. Uh, very, as you can see, very complex, uh, very specialized, and really using the space. These wheels are rotating and they're dunking the roots of the plants. Instead of having a water system, a river system, where you're taking the water and putting it right past the plants, here you just take the roots and dunk it in there and then go on to your next one. Um, so, you know, and people are looking to do this on a, on a very, very large scale. Uh, for a couple of reasons that we've already talked about, and the benefits, water conservation, um, as well as just the sheer growth. Yes? Do you think that's the most space-saving design right here? I don't know. Um, I haven't seen this up close, but I think, I think there definitely could be some great benefits. I also think there could be maybe some criticisms here um, about, you know, I don't know what it took to get all these materials and what kind of you know ecological footprint you're 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 you know um, placing while you're kind of constructing these systems you know and that's kind of the backside of large commercial farms that are doing this. Um, it's still another question of any other industry. How do you get your materials and um, what are they doing to the environment and the energy that it takes to get those materials? What's that doing to the environment in the same way? So. I think, I think these are really great design questions. Yes? It looks like probably the most space-efficient space system that we've seen. 
Is it the most, you know, cash efficient? <laughs> Probably not. This looks like a techno overreach for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, get a, you know, if, you're, if this is Epcot Center and you're selling tickets, uh, then yeah, do this. But if you just want to make a profit, probably not. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. In yeah, this thank season. you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, some some sure. engineer had, sure. a, had a field day here. Uh, more, of a, more of a headache. Uh, depending on who's managing it, right? Dreaming it and then uh, managing it every day, right? Um, okay, so here's this a really mind-blowing example I came across um, actually like a week ago. Um, and this is what I was talking about earlier with the algae. This is a massive lake in China. They have this, like, way too many nitrates, this toxic form of nitrogen in the water. And it was just green and gross. And they're having problems with pollution, right? Anything, when it's in a system, there's too much of it, it becomes a toxin and becomes a pollutant because it's out of this kind of ecosystemic balance, okay? So they made floating rafts. Very, this is very close to kind of the Chinapa that we saw earlier with the Aztecs. Um, and this, um, they're growing rice and all kinds of other vegetables on floating rafts. And within um, two months time period, they went from this massive algae bloom, really um, toxic, polluting lake, to a clear lake in which they were also getting large amounts of food that comes from this. I mean, clear in a sense of any lake could be, right? You know, you're swimming in a lake. Okay, two different questions. Yes, Bruce first. So what, what was it that um, cleared the nitrates from the, from the lake? The plants. Okay. And it didn't, it, it didn't kill the plants, though, if it was at a toxic level? No, it didn't. Um, and um, as you can see, this rice seems to be pretty happy. Uh, sir, you had another question? Do you think that this, what they're doing here is a potential maybe solution or at least a uh, setback to the pollution problems that the rivers have in China, like the plastic spill here? Could, could that even potentially over time or over the time break down those plastics and those pollutants? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, as far as our recent recorded history of what we know of aquaponics, its limits and possibilities um, have just not been charted or explored. We just haven't been working with it and never had a record for too long. I don't know. I really, I want to. I don't want to say everything's possible, but I also don't want to say, well, we haven't. We've seen it all, right? Um, and, but what the plants are functioning here is yes, we get a food source from it, right? But we also get this like a wetland. Um, function. We have, a, we have a, a biological filter. The plants are coming in here and cleaning the water out in the form of food for them, right? Nature, there is no waste. It's only food for the next thing. And um, so that's kind of the solution here. Now, there are other, you know, uh, forms of bio, what we call biological remediation or, or cleaning. Um, Paul Stamets does this a lot with uh, mushrooms and in different rivers. I mean, I really think there are a lot of solutions out there. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, I wonder if this would work in the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. I, I think this is a really great question. I mean, who knows, right? Um, it hasn't really been tried yet, but you know, we have 6,000 uh, square miles of a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, primarily because of runoff from commercial farming practices in the Midwest, especially in my home state of Iowa, um, in which we have lots and lots of um, disturbing the soil, tillage, and then putting on a very extensive amount of uh, liquid fertilizers, high in nitrates, which can be toxic in high forms, and then lots of rain washing that down into the river and to the aquifers and other water systems, and that's carrying that out to, yes, the Gulf of Mexico and creating this dead zone, right? We have very large area, dead zone meaning there is no basically biological function that's going on there. Like sea creatures cannot live there. So um, I think possible, yes, yes. So not only a food possibility, but the slide really does show us, um, and this, this story tells us, um, it has multiple functions. That might just be at the very least a healing um, process for, for an ecosystem.
Were you going to say something, Jason? Yeah. yeah, you'd want to catch it before it got to the Gulf because you can't grow most plants in salt water. But, oh, but right. that, what do they call it? Well, it's half salt water and half river water. Yeah, brackish. Yeah, brackish. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, the, there is an ecosystem in like Mobile, Alabama, and it's fresh water. Um, here, here's just some more fruit. Here's people growing uh, papayas in aquaponics. You can see all the way to the right. Cucumbers, uh, I think those are nasturtium flowers. I mean, it's just the, the possibilities, um, especially if you have a, what we were talking about, an ebb and flow system, where you only circulate the water a few times an hour, it's not continuous flow. Then you can really, I mean, what, can, what do you want to grow? That's kind of the question. You can, people even grow root vegetables, you know, uh, carrots into the medium, and you know, or, or like daikon radishes, right? The drillers of the herb, you know, um, and you you could grow them into the medium. Um, obviously, if you're, you know, have like you see in the tree, anything you can grow above what you would grow the, above the soil normally, that has a lot more space. So generally, those kind of things are um, great. I think as far as the respect of time, I have lots of, this is the really specific details I was mentioning at the beginning, and you're gonna get all of this. Um, but I think um, maybe the last thing we'd like to look at is uh, the common mistakes that we've made or we've seen, we've read about, um, you know, to look for. And then I would like to open it up just for primarily for our last half, half hour to do questions. Um, so, you know, as far as any type of things we've talked about, clarification or, or anything like that, uh, to make sure we get all those covered because there's not enough time for us to do all this specific stuff. Okay? So, as far as um, common mistakes go, we've talked about overfeeding. Um, Jason already mentioned this, you know, this is a problem because it could actually become a pollutant in your system. Um, or it could hurt your fish. Next one, um, you know, not having overflow backups. What if your um, something gets clogged and then all of a sudden you have all this water coming in and you don't have the space for it, it's just going to flood out everywhere, right? And then when your pump keeps going, eventually your pump is going to keep pumping that water and if it's not going back into the fish tank, all of a sudden you have a beached whale scenario, right? Your fish in the fish tank are like, hey, I had some water and now it's gone, okay? So um, this is another part of the redundancy. We're gonna build two overflow pipes tomorrow on our unit. So in case the water gets to a certain level, then it just, we have a pipe, it goes straight back into the fish tank. It drains right back off. So this is a part of the, of the design process. Um, not having sufficient heat uh, for cold snaps, as Jason was talking about earlier. Um, not having pump backups. So if your pump breaks, the water's you know not going around, um, that causes problems. Insufficient aeration. There's not enough oxygen for your plants, your worms that are living in the system. Um, if you come tomorrow, we'll be able to see the worms in the system that, that Jason has. The multiple tiers. There's 